Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. Remember to hit the like button and subscribe if you would like to receive daily updates about audiobooks. Feel free to leave book suggestions in the comments section. Her Lover By Maxim Gorky An acquaintance of mine once told me the following story. When I was a student at Moscow I happened to live alongside one of those ladies whose repute is questionable. She was a Pole, and they called her Teresa. She was a tallish, powerfully built brunette, with black, bushy eyebrows and a large coarse face as if carved out by a hatchet the bestial gleam of her dark eyes, her thick bass voice, her cabman-like gait and her immense muscular vigor, worthy of a fishwife, inspired me with horror. I lived on the top flight and her garret was opposite to mine. I never left my door open when I knew her to be at home. But this, after all, was a very rare occurrence. Sometimes I chanced to meet her on the staircase or in the yard, and she would smile upon me with a smile which seemed to me to be sly and cynical. Occasionally, I saw her drunk, with bleary eyes, tousled hair, and a particularly hideous grin. On such occasions she would speak to me. How do ye do, Mr. Student, and her stupid laugh would still further intensify my loathing of her. I should have liked to have changed my quarters in order to have avoided such encounters and greetings, but my little chamber was a nice one, and there was such a wide view from the window, and it was always so quiet in the street below so I endured. And one morning I was sprawling on my couch, trying to find some sort of excuse for not attending my class, when the door opened, and the bass voice of Teresa the loathsome resounded from my threshold, good health to you, Mr. Student. What do you want? I said. I saw that her face was confused and supplicatory. It was a very unusual sort of face for her. Sir. I want to beg a favor of you. Will you grant it me? I lay there silent, and thought to myself, gracious. Courage, my boy. I want to send a letter home, that's what it is, she said, her voice was beseeching, soft, timid. Deuce take you. I thought, but up I jumped, sat down at my table, took a sheet of paper, and said, come here, sit down, and dictate. She came, sat down very gingerly on a chair, and looked at me with a guilty look. Well, to whom do you want to write? To Bolslav Kashput, at the town of Svayeptsiana, on the Warsaw Road. Well, fire away. My dear Bowles, my darling, my faithful lover. May the mother of God protect thee. Thou heart of gold, why hast thou not written for such a long time to thy sorrowing little dove, Teresa? I very nearly burst out laughing. A sorrowing little dove, more than five feet high, with fists a stone and more in weight, and as black a face as if the little dove had lived all its life in a chimney, and had never once washed itself. Restraining myself somehow, I asked, who is this bolest? Bowles, Mr. Student, she said, as if offended with me for blundering over the name, he is Bowles my young man. Young man. Why are you so surprised, sir? Cannot I, a girl, have a young man? She? A girl? Well. Oh, why not? I said. All things are possible. And has he been your young man long? Six years. Oh, ho. I thought. Well, let us write your letter. And I tell you plainly that I would willingly have changed places with this Bowles if his fair correspondent had been not Teresa but something less than she. I thank you most heartily, sir, for your kind services, said Teresa to me, with a curtsy. Perhaps underscore I underscore can show underscore you underscore some service, eh? No, I most humbly thank you all the same. Perhaps, sir, your shirts or your trousers may want a little mending? I felt that this mastodon in petticoats had made me grow quite red with shame, and I told her pretty sharply that I had no need whatever of her services. She departed. A week or two passed away. It was evening. 
I was sitting at my window whistling and thinking of some expedient for enabling me to get away from myself. I was bored, the weather was dirty. I didn't want to go out, and out of sheer ennui I began a course of self-analysis and reflection. This also was dull enough work, but I didn't care about doing anything else. Then the door opened. Heaven be praised. Someone came in. Oh, Mr. Student, you have no pressing business, I hope? It was Teresa. Humph. No. What is it? I was going to ask you, sir, to write me another letter. Very well. To Bowles, eh? No, this time it is from him. What? Stupid that I am. It is not for me, Mr. Student, I beg your pardon. It is for a friend of mine, that is to say, not a friend but an acquaintance a man acquaintance. He has a sweetheart just like me here, Teresa. That's how it is. Will you, sir, write a letter to this Teresa? I looked at her her face was troubled, her fingers were trembling. I was a bit fogged at first and then I guessed how it was. Look here, my lady, I said, there are no Bolzas or Teresas at all, and you've been telling me a pack of lies. Don't you come sneaking about me any longer. I have no wish whatever to cultivate your acquaintance. Do you understand? And suddenly she grew strangely terrified and distraught, she began to shift from foot to foot without moving from the place, and spluttered comically, as if she wanted to say something and couldn't. I waited to see what would come of all this, and I saw and felt that, apparently, I had made a great mistake in suspecting her of wishing to draw me from the path of righteousness. It was evidently something very different. Mr. Student, she began, and suddenly, waving her hand, she turned abruptly towards the door and went out. I remained with a very unpleasant feeling in my mind. I listened. Her door was flung violently to plainly the poor wench was very angry. I thought it over, and resolved to go to her, and, inviting her to come in here, write everything she wanted. I entered her apartment. I looked round. She was sitting at the table, leaning on her elbows, with her head in her hands. Listen to me, I said. Now, whenever I come to this point in my story, I always feel horribly awkward and idiotic. Well, well. Listen to me, I said. She leaped from her seat, came towards me with flashing eyes, and laying her hands on my shoulders, began to whisper, or rather to hum in her peculiar bass voice, Look you, now. It's like this. There's no bowls at all, and there's no Teresa either. But what's that to you? Is it a hard thing for you to draw your pen over paper? Eh? Ah, and underscore you underscore, too. Still such a little fair-haired boy. There's nobody at all, neither Bowles, nor Teresa, only me. There you have it, and much good may it do you. Pardon me, said I, altogether flabbergasted by such a reception, what is it all about? There's no Bowles, you say? No. So it is. And no Teresa either? And no Teresa. I'm Teresa. I didn't understand it at all. I fixed my eyes upon her, and tried to make out which of us was taking leave of his or her senses. But she went again to the table, searched about for something, came back to me, and said in an offended tone, if it was so hard for you to write to Bowles, look, there's your letter, take it. Others will write for me. I looked. In her hand was my letter to Bowles. Phew. Listen, Teresa. What is the meaning of all this? Why must you get others to write for you when I have already written it, and you haven't sent it? Sent it where? Why, to this Bowles. There's no such person. I absolutely did not understand it. There was nothing for me but to spit and go. Then she explained. What is it, she said, still offended. There's no such person, I tell you, and she extended her arms as if she herself did not understand why there should be no such person. 
but I wanted him to be. Am I then not a human creature like the rest of them? Yes, yes, I know, I know, of course. Yet no harm was done to anyone by my writing to him that I can see. Pardon me to whom? To Bowles, of course. But he doesn't exist. Alas. Alas. But what if he doesn't? He doesn't exist, but he underscore might, underscore I write to him, and it looks as if he did exist. And Teresa that's me, and he replies to me, and then I write to him again. I understood at last. And I felt so sick, so miserable, so ashamed, somehow. Alongside of me, not three yards away, lived a human creature who had nobody in the world to treat her kindly, affectionately, and this human being had invented a friend for herself. Look, now. You wrote me a letter to Bowles, and I gave it to someone else to read it to me, and when they read it to me I listened and fancied that Bowles was there. And I asked you to write me a letter from Bowles to Teresa that is to me. When they write such a letter for me, and read it to me, I feel quite sure that Bowles is there. And life grows easier for me in consequence. Deuce take you for a blockhead, said I to myself when I heard this. And from thenceforth, regularly, twice a week, I wrote a letter to Bowles, and an answer from Bowles to Teresa. I wrote those answers well. She, of course, listened to them, and wept like anything, roared, I should say, with her bass voice. And in return for my thus moving her to tears by real letters from the imaginary bowls, she began to mend the holes I had in my socks, shirts, and other articles of clothing. Subsequently, about three months after this history began, they put her in prison for something or other. No doubt by this time she is dead. My acquaintance shook the ash from his cigarette, looked pensively up at the sky, and thus concluded, well, well, the more a human creature has tasted of bitter things the more it hungers after the sweet things of life. And we, wrapped round in the rags of our virtues, and regarding others through the mist of our self-sufficiency, and persuaded of our universal impeccability, do not understand this. And the whole thing turns out pretty stupidly and very cruelly. The fallen classes, we say. And who are the fallen classes, I should like to know. They are, first of all, people with the same bones, flesh, and blood and nerves as ourselves. We have been told this day after day for ages. And we actually listen and the devil only knows how hideous the whole thing is. Or are we completely depraved by the loud sermonizing of humanism? In reality, we also are fallen folks, and, so far as I can see, very deeply fallen into the abyss of self-sufficiency and the conviction of our own superiority. But enough of this. It is all as old as the hill so old that it is a shame to speak of it. Very old indeed yes, that's what it is. Lazarus By Leonid Andreev I, when Lazarus rose from the grave, after three days and nights in the mysterious thraldom of death, and returned alive to his home, it was a long time before anyone noticed the evil peculiarities in him that were later to make his very name terrible. His friends and relatives were jubilant that he had come back to life. They surrounded him with tenderness, they were lavish of their eager attentions, spending the greatest care upon his food and drink and the new garments they made for him. They clad him gorgeously in the glowing colors of hope and laughter, and when, arrayed like a bridegroom, he sat at table with them again, ate again, and drank again, they wept fondly and summoned the neighbors to look upon the man miraculously raised from the dead. The neighbors came and were moved with joy. Strangers arrived from distant cities and villages to worship the miracle. They burst into stormy exclamations, and buzzed around the house of Mary and Martha, like so many bees. That which was new in Lazarus' face and gestures they explained naturally, as the traces of his severe illness and the shock he had passed through. It was evident that the disintegration of the body had been halted by a miraculous power, but that the restoration had not been complete, that death had left upon his face and body the effect of an artist's unfinished sketch seen through a thin glass. 
On his temples, under his eyes, and in the hollow of his cheek lay a thick, earthy blue. His fingers were blue, too, and under his nails, which had grown long in the grave, the blue had turned livid. Here and there on his lips and body, the skin, blistered in the grave, had burst open and left reddish glistening cracks, as if covered with a thin, glassy slime. And he had grown exceedingly stout. His body was horribly bloated and suggested the fetid, damp smell of putrefaction. But the cadaverous, heavy odor that clung to his burial garments and, as it seemed, to his very body, soon wore off, and after some time the blue of his hands and face softened, and the reddish cracks of his skin smoothed out, though they never disappeared completely. Such was the aspect of Lazarus in his second life. It looked natural only to those who had seen him buried. Not merely Lazarus' face, but his very character, it seemed, had changed, though it astonished no one and did not attract the attention it deserved. Before his death Lazarus had been cheerful and careless, a lover of laughter and harmless jest. It was because of his good humor, pleasant and equable, his freedom from meanness and gloom, that he had been so beloved by the Master. Now he was grave and silent, neither he himself jested nor did he laugh at the jests of others, and the words he spoke occasionally were simple, ordinary and necessary words words as much devoid of sense and depth as are the sounds with which an animal expresses pain and pleasure, thirst and hunger. Such words a man may speak all his life and no one would ever know the sorrows and joys that dwelt within him. Thus it was that Lazarus sat at the festive table among his friends and relatives his face the face of a corpse over which, for three days, death had reigned in darkness, his garments gorgeous and festive, glittering with gold, bloody red and purple, his mien heavy and silent. He was horribly changed and strange, but as yet undiscovered. In high waves, now mild, now stormy, the festivities went on around him. Warm glances of love caressed his face, still cold with the touch of the grave, and a friend's warm hand patted his bluish, heavy hand. And the music played joyous tunes mingled of the sounds of the tympanum, the pipe, the zither, and the dulcimer. It was as if bees were humming, locusts buzzing and birds singing over the happy home of Mary and Martha. Two, someone recklessly lifted the veil. By one breath of an uttered word he destroyed the serene charm, and uncovered the truth in its ugly nakedness. No thought was clearly defined in his mind, when his lips smilingly asked, Why do you not tell us, Lazarus, what was there? And all became silent, struck with the question. Only now it seemed to have occurred to them that for three days Lazarus had been dead, and they looked with curiosity, awaiting an answer. But Lazarus remained silent. You will not tell us, wondered the inquirer. Is it so terrible there? Again his thought lagged behind his words. Had it preceded them, he would not have asked the question, for, at the very moment he uttered it, his heart sank with a dread fear. All grew restless, they awaited the words of Lazarus anxiously. But he was silent, cold and severe, and his eyes were cast down. And now, as if for the first time, they perceived the horrible bluishness of his face and the loathsome corpulence of his body. On the table, as if forgotten by Lazarus, lay his livid blue hand, and all eyes were riveted upon it, as though expecting the desired answer from that hand. The musicians still played, then silence fell upon them, too, and the gay sounds died down, as scattered coals are extinguished by water. The pipe became mute, and the ringing tympanum and the murmuring dulcimer, and as though a chord were broken, as though song itself were dying, the zither echoed a trembling broken sound. Then all was quiet. You will not, repeated the inquirer, unable to restrain his babbling tongue. Silence reigned, and the livid blue hand lay motionless. It moved slightly, and the company sighed with relief and raised their eyes. Lazarus, risen from the dead, was looking straight at them, embracing all with one glance, heavy and terrible. This was on the third day after Lazarus had arisen from the grave. Since then many had felt that his gaze was the gaze of destruction, 
but neither those who had been forever crushed by it, nor those who in the prime of life, mysterious even as death, had found the will to resist his glance, could ever explain the terror that lay immovable in the depths of his black pupils. He looked quiet and simple. One felt that he had no intention to hide anything, but also no intention to tell anything. His look was cold, as of one who is entirely indifferent to all that is alive. And many careless people who pressed around him, and did not notice him, later learned with wonder and fear the name of this stout, quiet man who brushed against them with his sumptuous, gaudy garments. The sun did not stop shining when he looked, neither did the fountain cease playing, and the eastern sky remained cloudless and blue as always, but the man who fell under his inscrutable gaze could no longer feel the sun, nor hear the fountain, nor recognize his native sky. Sometimes he would cry bitterly, sometimes tear his hair in despair and madly call for help, but generally it happened that the men thus stricken by the gaze of Lazarus began to fade away listlessly and quietly and pass into a slow death lasting many long years. They died in the presence of everybody, colorless, haggard and gloomy, like trees withering on rocky ground. Those who screamed in madness sometimes came back to life, but the others, never. So you will not tell us, Lazarus, what you saw there, the inquirer repeated for the third time. But now his voice was dull, and a dead, gray weariness looked stupidly from out his eyes. The faces of all present were also covered by the same dead gray weariness like a mist. The guests stared at one another stupidly, not knowing why they had come together or why they sat around this rich table. They stopped talking, and vaguely felt it was time to leave, but they could not overcome the lassitude that spread through their muscles. So they continued to sit there, each one isolated, like little dim lights scattered in the darkness of night. The musicians were paid to play, and they again took up the instruments, and again played gay or mournful airs. But it was music made to order, always the same tunes, and the guests listened wonderingly. Why was this music necessary, they thought, why was it necessary and what good did it do for people to pull at strings and blow their cheeks into thin pipes and produce varied and strange-sounding noises? How badly they play, said someone. The musicians were insulted and left. Then the guests departed one by one, for it was nearing night. And when the quiet darkness enveloped them, and it became easier to breathe, the image of Lazarus suddenly arose before each one in stern splendor. There he stood, with the blue face of a corpse and the raiment of a bridegroom, sumptuous and resplendent, in his eyes that cold stare in the depths of which lurked underscore the horrible, underscore they stood still as if turned into stone. The darkness surrounded them, and in the midst of this darkness flamed up the horrible apparition, the supernatural vision, of the one who for three days had lain under the measureless power of death. Three days he had been dead. Thrice had the sun risen and set and he had lain dead. The children had played, the water had murmured as it streamed over the rocks, the hot dust had clouded the highway and he had been dead. And now he was among men again touched them looked at them underscore looked at them, underscore and through the black rings of his pupils, as through dark glasses, the unfathomable underscore their underscore gazed upon humanity. 3. No one took care of Lazarus, and no friends or kindred remained with him. Only the great desert, enfolding the holy city, came close to the threshold of his abode. It entered his home, and lay down on his couch like a spouse, and put out all the fires. No one cared for Lazarus. One after the other went away, even his sisters, Mary and Martha. For a long while Martha did not want to leave him, for she knew not who would nurse him or take care of him, and she cried and prayed. But one night, when the wind was roaming about the desert, and the rustling cypress trees were bending over the roof, she dressed herself quietly, and quietly went away. Lazarus probably heard how the door was slammed it had not shut properly and the wind kept knocking it continually against the post but he did not rise, did not go out, did not try to find out the reason. And the whole night until the morning the cypress trees hissed over his head, and the door swung to and fro, allowing the cold, greedily prowling desert to enter his dwelling. 
everybody shunned him as though he were a leper. They wanted to put a bell on his neck to avoid meeting him. But someone, turning pale, remarked it would be terrible if at night, under the windows, one should happen to hear Lazarus bell, and all grew pale and assented. Since he did nothing for himself, he would probably have starved had not his neighbors, in trepidation, saved some food for him. Children brought it to him. They did not fear him, neither did they laugh at him in the innocent cruelty in which children often laugh at unfortunates. They were indifferent to him, and Lazarus showed the same indifference to them. He showed no desire to thank them for their services, he did not try to pat the dark hands and look into the simple shining little eyes. Abandoned to the ravages of time and the desert, his house was falling to ruins, and his hungry, bleeding goats had long been scattered among his neighbors. His wedding garments had grown old. He wore them without changing them, as he had donned them on that happy day when the musicians played. He did not see the difference between old and new, between torn and whole. The brilliant colors were burnt and faded, the vicious dogs of the city and the sharp thorns of the desert had rent the fine clothes to shreds. During the day, when the sun beat down mercilessly upon all living things, and even the scorpions hid under the stones, convulsed with a mad desire to sting, he sat motionless in the burning rays, lifting high his blue face and shaggy wild beard. While yet the people were unafraid to speak to him, same one had asked him, Poor Lazarus! Do you find it pleasant to sit so, and look at the sun? And he answered, Yes, it is pleasant. The thought suggested itself to people that the cold of the three days in the grave had been so intense, its darkness so deep, that there was not in all the earth enough heat or light to warm Lazarus and lighten the gloom of his eyes, and inquirers turned away with a sigh. And when the setting sun, flat and purple-red, descended to earth, Lazarus went into the desert and walked straight toward it, as though intending to reach it. Always he walked directly toward the sun, and those who tried to follow him and find out what he did at night in the desert had indelibly imprinted upon their mind's vision the black silhouette of a tall, stout man against the red background of an immense disc. The horrors of the night drove them away, and so they never found out what Lazarus did in the desert, but the image of the black form against the red was burned forever into their brains. Like an animal with a cinder in its eye which furiously rubs its muzzle against its paws, they foolishly rubbed their eyes, but the impression left by Lazarus was ineffaceable, forgotten only in death. There were people living far away who never saw Lazarus and only heard of him. With an audacious curiosity which is stronger than fear and feeds on fear, with a secret sneer in their hearts, some of them came to him one day as he basked in the sun and entered into conversation with him. At that time his appearance had changed for the better and was not so frightful. At first the visitors snapped their fingers and thought disapprovingly of the foolish inhabitants of the holy city. But when the short talk came to an end and they went home, their expression was such that the inhabitants of the holy city at once knew their errand and said, Here go some more madmen at whom Lazarus has looked. The speakers raised their hands in silent pity. Other visitors came, among them brave warriors in clinking armor, who knew not fear, and happy youths who made merry with laughter and song. Busy merchants, jingling their coins, ran in for a while, and proud attendants at the temple placed their staffs at Lazarus' door. But no one returned the same as he came. A frightful shadow fell upon their souls, and gave a new appearance to the old familiar world. Those who felt any desire to speak, after they had been stricken by the gaze of Lazarus, described the change that had come over them somewhat like this, underscore all objects seen by the eye and palpable to the hand became empty, light and transparent, as though they were light shadows in the darkness, and this darkness enveloped the whole universe. It was dispelled neither by the sun, nor by the moon, nor by the stars, but embraced the earth like a mother, and clothed it in a boundless black veil underscore. Underscore into all bodies it penetrated, even into iron and stone, and the particles of the body lost their unity and became lonely. 
even to the heart of the particles it penetrated, and the particles of the particles became lonely underscore. Underscore the vast emptiness which surrounds the universe, was not filled with things seen, with sun or moon or stars, it stretched boundless, penetrating everywhere, disuniting everything, body from body, particle from particle underscore. Underscore in emptiness the trees spread their roots, themselves empty, in emptiness rose phantom temples, palaces and houses all empty, and in the emptiness moved restless man, himself empty in light, like a shadow underscore. Underscore there was no more a sense of time, the beginning of all things and their end merged into one. In the very moment when a building was being erected and one could hear the builders striking with their hammers, one seemed already to see its ruins, and then emptiness where the ruins were underscore. Underscore a man was just born, and funeral candles were already lighted at his head, and then were extinguished, and soon there was emptiness where before had been the man and the candles, underscore underscore and surrounded by darkness and empty waste, man trembled hopelessly before the dread of the infinite underscore. So spoke those who had a desire to speak. But much more could probably have been told by those who did not want to talk, and who died in silence. For, at that time there lived in Rome a celebrated sculptor by the name of Aurelius. Out of clay, marble and bronze he created forms of gods and men of such beauty that this beauty was proclaimed immortal. But he himself was not satisfied, and said there was a supreme beauty that he had never succeeded in expressing in marble or bronze. I have not yet gathered the radiance of the moon, he said, I have not yet caught the glare of the sun. There is no soul in my marble, there is no life in my beautiful bronze. And when by moonlight he would slowly wander along the roads, crossing the black shadows of the cypress trees, his white tunic flashing in the moonlight, those he met used to laugh good-naturedly and say, Is it moonlight that you are gathering, Aurelius? Why did you not bring some baskets along? And he, too, would laugh and point to his eyes and say, Here are the baskets in which I gather the light of the moon and the radiance of the sun. And that was the truth. In his eyes shone moon and sun. But he could not transmit the radiance to marble. Therein lay the greatest tragedy of his life. He was a descendant of an ancient race of patricians, had a good wife and children, and except in this one respect, lacked nothing. When the dark rumor about Lazarus reached him, he consulted his wife and friends and decided to make the long voyage to Judea, in order that he might look upon the man miraculously raised from the dead. He felt lonely in those days and hoped on the way to renew his jaded energies. What they told him about Lazarus did not frighten him. He had meditated much upon death. He did not like it, nor did he like those who tried to harmonize it with life. On this side, beautiful life, on the other, mysterious death, he reasoned, and no better lot could befall a man than to live to enjoy life and the beauty of living. And he already had conceived a desire to convince Lazarus of the truth of this view and to return his soul to life even as his body had been returned. This task did not appear impossible, for the reports about Lazarus, fearsome and strange as they were, did not tell the whole truth about him, but only carried a vague warning against something awful. Lazarus was getting up from a stone to follow in the path of the setting sun, on the evening when the rich Roman, accompanied by an armed slave, approached him, and in a ringing voice called to him, Lazarus. Lazarus saw a proud and beautiful face, made radiant by fame, and white garments and precious jewels shining in the sunlight. The ruddy rays of the sun lent to the head and face a likeness to dimly shining bronze that was what Lazarus saw. He sank back to his seat obediently, and wearily lowered his eyes. It is true you are not beautiful, my poor Lazarus, said the Roman quietly, playing with his gold chain. You are even frightful, my poor friend, and death was not lazy the day when you so carelessly fell into its arms. But you are as fat as a barrel, and fat people are not bad, as the great Caesar said. I do not understand why people are so afraid of you. You will permit me to stay with you overnight? It is already late, and I have no abode. 
Nobody had ever asked Lazarus to be allowed to pass the night with him. I have no bed, said he. I am somewhat of a warrior and can sleep sitting, replied the Roman. We shall make a light. I have no light. Then we will converse in the darkness like two friends. I suppose you have some wine? I have no wine. The Roman laughed. Now I understand why you are so gloomy and why you do not like your second life. No wine? Well, we shall do without. You know there are words that go to one's head even as Falernian wine. With a motion of his head he dismissed the slave, and they were alone. And again the sculptor spoke, but it seemed as though the sinking sun had penetrated into his words. They faded, pale and empty, as if trembling on weak feet, as if slipping and falling, drunk with the wine of anguish and despair. And black chasms appeared between the two men like remote hints of vast emptiness and vast darkness. Now I am your guest and you will not ill-treat me, Lazarus, said the Roman. Hospitality is binding even upon those who have been three days dead. Three days, I am told, you were in the grave. It must have been cold there, and it is from there that you have brought this bad habit of doing without light and wine. I like a light. It gets dark so quickly here. Your eyebrows and forehead have an interesting line, even as the ruins of castles covered with the ashes of an earthquake. But why in such strange, ugly clothes? I have seen the bridegrooms of your country, they wear clothes like that such ridiculous clothes such awful garments. Are you a bridegroom? Already the sun had disappeared. A gigantic black shadow was approaching fast from the west, as if prodigious bare feet were rustling over the sand. And the chill breezes stole up behind. In the darkness you seem even bigger, Lazarus, as though you had grown stouter in these few minutes. Do you feed on darkness, perchance? And I would like a light, just a small light, just a small light. And I am cold. The nights here are so barbarously cold. If it were not so dark, I should say you were looking at me, Lazarus. Yes, it seems, you are looking. You are looking. Underscore you are looking at me, underscore. I feel it now you are smiling. The night had come, and a heavy blackness filled the air. How good it will be when the sun rises again tomorrow. You know I am a great sculptor so my friends call me. I create, yes, they say I create, but for that daylight is necessary. I give life to cold marble. I melt the ringing bronze in the fire, in a bright, hot fire. Why did you touch me with your hand? Come, said Lazarus, you are my guest. And they went into the house. And the shadows of the long evening fell on the earth. The slave at last grew tired waiting for his master, and when the sun stood high he came to the house. And he saw, directly under its burning rays, Lazarus and his master sitting close together. They looked straight up and were silent. The slave wept and cried aloud, Master, what ails you, Master? The same day Aurelius left for Rome. The whole way he was thoughtful and silent, attentively examining everything, the people, the ship, and the sea, as though endeavoring to recall something. On the sea a great storm overtook them, and all the while Aurelius remained on deck and gazed eagerly at the approaching and falling waves. When he reached home his family were shocked at the terrible change in his demeanor, but he calmed them with the words, I have found it. In the dusty clothes which he had worn during the entire journey and had not changed, he began his work, and the marble ringingly responded to the resounding blows of the hammer. Long and eagerly he worked, admitting no one. At last, one morning, he announced that the work was ready, and gave instructions that all his friends, and the severe critics and judges of art, be called together. Then he donned gorgeous garments, shining with gold, glowing with the purple of the bison. Here is what I have created, he said thoughtfully. His friends looked, and immediately the shadow of deep sorrow covered their faces. It was a thing monstrous, possessing none of the forms familiar to the eye, 
yet not devoid of a hint of some new unknown form. On a thin tortuous little branch, or rather an ugly likeness of one, lay crooked, strange, unsightly, shapeless heaps of something turned outside in, or something turned inside out wild fragments which seemed to be feebly trying to get away from themselves. And, accidentally, under one of the wild projections, they noticed a wonderfully sculptured butterfly, with transparent wings, trembling as though with a weak longing to fly. Why that wonderful butterfly, Aurelius, timidly asked someone. I do not know, answered the sculptor. The truth had to be told, and one of his friends, the one who loved Aurelius best, said, This is ugly, my poor friend. It must be destroyed. Give me the hammer. And with two blows he destroyed the monstrous mass, leaving only the wonderfully sculptured butterfly. After that Aurelius created nothing. He looked with absolute indifference at marble and at bronze and at his own divine creations, in which dwelt immortal beauty. In the hope of breathing into him once again the old flame of inspiration, with the idea of awakening his dead soul, his friends led him to see the beautiful creations of others, but he remained indifferent and no smile warmed his closed lips. And only after they spoke to him much and long of beauty, he would reply wearily, but all this is a lie. And in the daytime, when the sun was shining, he would go into his rich and beautifully laid out garden, and finding a place where there was no shadow, would expose his bare head and his dull eyes to the glitter and burning heat of the sun. Red and white butterflies fluttered around, down into the marble cistern ran splashing water from the crooked mouth of a blissfully drunken satyr, but he sat motionless, like a pale shadow of that other one who, in a far land, at the very gates of the stony desert, also sat motionless under the fiery sun. V. And it came about finally that Lazarus was summoned to Rome by the great Augustus. They dressed him in gorgeous garments as though it had been ordained that he was to remain a bridegroom to an unknown bride until the very day of his death. It was as if an old coffin, rotten and falling apart, were regilded over and over, and gay tassels were hung on it. And solemnly they conducted him in gala attire, as though in truth it were a bridal procession, the runners loudly sounding the trumpet that the way be made for the ambassadors of the emperor. But the roads along which he passed were deserted. His entire native land cursed the execrable name of Lazarus, the man miraculously brought to life, and the people scattered at the mere report of his horrible approach. The trumpeters blew lonely blasts, and only the desert answered with a dying echo. Then they carried him across the sea on the saddest and most gorgeous ship that was ever mirrored in the azure waves of the Mediterranean. There were many people aboard, but the ship was silent and still as a coffin, and the water seemed to moan as it parted before the short curved prow. Lazarus sat lonely, bearing his head to the sun, and listening in silence to the splashing of the waters. Further away the seamen and the ambassadors gathered like a crowd of distressed shadows. If a thunderstorm had happened to burst upon them at that time or the wind had overwhelmed the red sails, the ship would probably have perished, for none of those who were on her had strength or desire enough to fight for life. With supreme effort some went to the side of the ship and eagerly gazed at the blue, transparent abyss. Perhaps they imagined they saw a naiad flashing a pink shoulder through the waves, or an insanely joyous and drunken centaur galloping by, splashing up the water with his hoofs. But the sea was deserted and mute, and so was the watery abyss. Listlessly Lazarus set foot on the streets of the Eternal City, as though all its riches, all the majesty of its gigantic edifices, all the luster and beauty and music of refined life, were simply the echo of the wind in the desert, or the misty images of hot running sand. Chariots whirled by, the crowd of strong, beautiful, haughty men passed on, builders of the eternal city and proud partakers of its life, songs rang out, fountains laughed, pearly laughter of women filled the air, while the drunkard philosophized and the sober ones smilingly listened, horseshoes rattled on the pavement. And surrounded on all sides by glad sounds, a fat, heavy man moved through the center of the city like a cold spot of silence, sowing in his path grief, anger and vague, carking distress. Who dared to be sad in Rome? 
indignantly demanded frowning citizens, and in two days the swift-tongued Rome knew of Lazarus, the man miraculously raised from the grave, and timidly evaded him. There were many brave men ready to try their strength, and at their senseless call Lazarus came obediently. The emperor was so engrossed with state affairs that he delayed receiving the visitor, and for seven days Lazarus moved among the people. A jovial drunkard met him with a smile on his red lips. Drink, Lazarus, drink, he cried, would not Augustus laugh to see you drink? And naked, besotted women laughed, and decked the blue hands of Lazarus with rose leaves. But the drunkard looked into the eyes of Lazarus and his joy ended forever. Thereafter he was always drunk. He drank no more, but was drunk all the time, shadowed by fearful dreams, instead of the joyous reveries that wine gives. Fearful dreams became the food of his broken spirit. Fearful dreams held him day and night in the mists of monstrous fantasy, and death itself was no more fearful than the apparition of its fierce precursor. Lazarus came to a youth and his lass who loved each other and were beautiful in their love. Proudly and strongly holding in his arms his beloved one, the youth said, with gentle pity, Look at us, Lazarus, and rejoice with us. Is there anything stronger than love? And Lazarus looked at them. And their whole life they continued to love one another, but their love became mournful and gloomy, even as those cypress trees over the tombs that feed their roots on the putrescence of the grave, and strive in vain in the quiet evening hour to touch the sky with their pointed tops. Hurled by fathomless life forces into each other's arms, they mingled their kisses with tears, their joy with pain, and only succeeded in realizing the more vividly a sense of their slavery to the silent nothing. Forever united, forever parted, they flashed like sparks, and like sparks went out in boundless darkness. Lazarus came to a proud sage, and the sage said to him, I already know all the horrors that you may tell me, Lazarus. With what else can you terrify me? Only a few moments passed before the sage realized that the knowledge of the horrible is not the horrible, and that the sight of death is not death. And he felt that in the eyes of the infinite wisdom and folly are the same, for the infinite knows them not. And the boundaries between knowledge and ignorance, between truth and falsehood, between top and bottom, faded and his shapeless thought was suspended in emptiness. Then he grasped his grey head in his hands and cried out insanely, I cannot think. I cannot think. Thus it was that under the cool gaze of Lazarus, the man miraculously raised from the dead, all that serves to affirm life, its sense and its joys, perished. And people began to say it was dangerous to allow him to see the emperor, that it were better to kill him and bury him secretly, and swear he had disappeared. Swords were sharpened and youths devoted to the welfare of the people announced their readiness to become assassins, when Augustus upset the cruel plans by demanding that Lazarus appear before him. Even though Lazarus could not be kept away, it was felt that the heavy impression conveyed by his face might be somewhat softened. With that end in view expert painters, barbers and artists were secured who worked the whole night on Lazarus' head. His beard was trimmed and curled. The disagreeable and deadly bluishness of his hands and face was covered up with paint, his hands were whitened, his cheeks rouged. The disgusting wrinkles of suffering that ridged his old face were patched up and painted, and on the smooth surface, wrinkles of good nature and laughter, and of pleasant, good-humored cheeriness, were laid on artistically with fine brushes. Lazarus submitted indifferently to all they did with him, and soon was transformed into a stout, nice-looking old man, for all the world a quiet and good-humored grandfather of numerous grandchildren. He looked as though the smile with which he told funny stories had not left his lips, as though a quiet tenderness still lay hidden in the corner of his eyes. But the wedding dress they did not dare to take off, and they could not change his eyes the dark, terrible eyes from out of which stared the incomprehensible underscore their underscore. 6. Lazarus was untouched by the magnificence of the imperial apartments. He remained stolidly indifferent, as though he saw no contrast between his ruined house at the edge of the desert and the solid, beautiful palace of stone.
Under his feet the hard marble of the floor took on the semblance of the moving sands of the desert, and to his eyes the throngs of gaily dressed, haughty men were as unreal as the emptiness of the air. They looked not into his face as he passed by, fearing to come under the awful bane of his eyes, but when the sound of his heavy steps announced that he had passed, heads were lifted, and eyes examined with timid curiosity the figure of the corpulent, tall, slightly stooping old man, as he slowly passed into the heart of the imperial palace. If death itself had appeared men would not have feared it so much, for hitherto death had been known to the dead only, and life to the living only, and between these two there had been no bridge. But this strange being knew death, and that knowledge of his was felt to be mysterious and cursed. He will kill our great, divine Augustus, men cried with horror, and they hurled curses after him. Slowly and stolidly he passed them by, penetrating ever deeper into the palace. Caesar knew already who Lazarus was, and was prepared to meet him. He was a courageous man, he felt his power was invincible, and in the fateful encounter with the man, wonderfully raised from the dead, he refused to lean on other men's weak help. Man to man, face to face, he met Lazarus. Do not fix your gaze on me, Lazarus, he commanded. I have heard that your head is like the head of Medusa, and turns into stone all upon whom you look. But I should like to have a close look at you, and to talk to you before I turn into stone, he added in a spirit of playfulness that concealed his real misgivings. Approaching him, he examined closely Lazarus' face and his strange festive clothes. Though his eyes were sharp and keen, he was deceived by the skillful counterfeit. Well, your appearance is not terrible, venerable sir. But all the worse for men, when the terrible takes on such a venerable and pleasant appearance. Now let us talk. Augustus sat down, and as much by glance as by words began the discussion. Why did you not salute me when you entered? Lazarus answered indifferently, I did not know it was necessary. You are a Christian? No. Augustus nodded approvingly. That is good. I do not like the Christians. They shake the tree of life, forbidding it to bear fruit, and they scatter to the wind its fragrant blossoms. But who are you? With some effort Lazarus answered, I was dead. I heard about that. But who are you now? Lazarus' answer came slowly. Finally he said again, listlessly and indistinctly, I was dead. Listen to me, stranger, said the emperor sharply, giving expression to what had been in his mind before. My empire is an empire of the living, my people are a people of the living and not of the dead. You are superfluous here. I do not know who you are, I do not know what you have seen there, but if you lie, I hate your lies, and if you tell the truth, I hate your truth. In my heart I feel the pulse of life, in my hands I feel power, and my proud thoughts, like eagles, fly through space. Behind my back, under the protection of my authority, under the shadow of the laws I have created, men live and labor and rejoice. Do you hear this divine harmony of life? Do you hear the war cry that men hurl into the face of the future, challenging it to strife? Augustus extended his arms reverently and solemnly cried out, Blessed art thou, great divine life. But Lazarus was silent, and the emperor continued more severely, You are not wanted here. Pitiful remnant, half devoured of death, you fill men with distress and aversion to life. Like a caterpillar on the fields, you are gnawing away at the full seed of joy, exuding the slime of despair and sorrow. Your truth is like a rusted sword in the hands of a knight assassin, and I shall condemn you to death as an assassin. But first I want to look into your eyes. Mayhap only cowards fear them, and brave men are spurred on to struggle and victory. Then will you merit not death but a reward. Look at me, Lazarus. At first it seemed to divine Augustus as if a friend were looking at him, so soft, so alluring, so gently fascinating was the gaze of Lazarus. It promised not horror but quiet rest, and the infinite dwelt there as a fond mistress, a compassionate sister, a mother. 
and ever stronger grew its gentle embrace, until he felt, as it were, the breath of a mouth hungry for kisses. Then it seemed as if iron bones protruded in a ravenous grip, and closed upon him in an iron band, and cold nails touched his heart, and slowly, slowly sank into it. It pains me, said divine Augustus, growing pale, but look, Lazarus, look. Ponderous gates, shutting off eternity, appeared to be slowly swinging open, and through the growing aperture poured in, coldly and calmly, the awful horror of the infinite. Boundless emptiness and boundless gloom entered like two shadows, extinguishing the sun, removing the ground from under the feet, and the cover from over the head. And the pain in his icy heart ceased. Look at me, look at me, Lazarus, commanded Augustus, staggering. Time ceased and the beginning of things came perilously near to the end. The throne of Augustus, so recently erected, fell to pieces, and emptiness took the place of the throne and of Augustus. Rome fell silently into ruins. A new city rose in its place, and it too was erased by emptiness. Like phantom giants, cities, kingdoms, and countries swiftly fell and disappeared into emptiness swallowed up in the black maw of the infinite. Cease, commanded the emperor. Already the accent of indifference was in his voice. His arms hung powerless, and his eagle eyes flashed and were dimmed again, struggling against overwhelming darkness. You have killed me, Lazarus, he said drowsily. These words of despair saved him. He thought of the people, whose shield he was destined to be, and a sharp, redeeming pang pierced his dull heart. He thought of them doomed to perish, and he was filled with anguish. First they seemed bright shadows in the gloom of the infinite how terrible. Then they appeared as fragile vessels with life-agitated blood, and hearts that knew both sorrow and great joy, and he thought of them with tenderness. And so thinking and feeling, inclining the scales now to the side of life, now to the side of death, he slowly returned to life, to find in its suffering and joy a refuge from the gloom, emptiness and fear of the infinite. No, you did not kill me, Lazarus, said he firmly. But I will kill you. Go. Evening came and divine Augustus partook of food and drink with great joy. But there were moments when his raised arm would remain suspended in the air, and the light of his shining, eager eyes was dimmed. It seemed as if an icy wave of horror washed against his feet. He was vanquished but not killed, and coldly awaited his doom, like a black shadow. His nights were haunted by horror, but the bright days still brought him the joys, as well as the sorrows, of life. Next day, by order of the emperor, they burned out Lazarus' eyes with hot irons and sent him home. Even Augustus dared not kill him. Lazarus returned to the desert and the desert received him with the breath of the hissing wind and the ardor of the glowing sun. Again he sat on the stone with matted beard uplifted, and two black holes, where the eyes had once been, looked dull and horrible at the sky. In the distance the holy city surged and roared restlessly, but near him all was deserted and still. No one approached the place where Lazarus, miraculously raised from the dead, passed his last days, for his neighbors had long since abandoned their homes. His cursed knowledge, driven by the hot irons from his eyes deep into the brain, lay there in ambush, as if from ambush it might spring out upon men with a thousand unseen eyes. No one dared to look at Lazarus. And in the evening, when the sun, swollen crimson and growing larger, bent its way toward the west, blind Lazarus slowly groped after it. He stumbled against stones and fell, corpulent and feeble, he rose heavily and walked on, and against the red curtain of sunset his dark form and outstretched arms gave him the semblance of a cross. It happened once that he went and never returned. Thus ended the second life of Lazarus, who for three days had been in the mysterious thraldom of death and then was miraculously raised from the dead. The End Thank you for being with us until the end. We hope you had a wonderful time. If you enjoyed our book, please support us by liking and leaving comments. We look forward to seeing you soon with another book. Best regards.